Grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is great to be here at Faith to the Saints of Grand Blank to proclaim God's word. And as Pastor Bierman mentioned, I'm here with my family, and I see some other families of young children here. It's great to be in God's house, and for those who uh, maybe your children have grown up, you can recall the days of having a, like I have, a four, six, and eight-year-old in the house. And children, whether you've had them or you've been around them, they love to ask questions. I don't think we go much more than about a minute in our house without one of them asking a question, sometimes philosophical. Why is the sky blue? Other times, it's asking for something. And most often, it's this question. Can I have a piece of candy? What kid doesn't love candy? What adult doesn't love candy? Right? I'm, I'm thankful my children ask my wife and I for candy. And if they've been behaving well, if it's perhaps been uh, a while and they haven't had any food, we usually say, sure, go ahead, grab a piece. But there are those times where we say, no. I think of one specific time a few months back. Saturday morning, I wake up with the kids. We do our Saturday morning routine, which I actually live in Grand Blank. So it's turning out of our neighborhood on Perry Road, going to Don's Donuts and getting some donuts in the morning. I love donuts. My kids love donuts. Don Donuts is a great little place to have not too far away from our house, just right down the road here. And we go back. And we eat these donuts, more donuts than we should have in our family. Full of sugar, more sugar than a family should consume. My kids consuming the majority of this sugar. And about 10 minutes later, without fail, there the question is asked. Can I have a piece of candy? No. You can't. I think it was the sugar rush that my children had. They wanted more candy, and so they conspired, like children do. And I said, no, you can't have any candy. Go find something to do. I have work to do up in my office. My wife's out uh, taking care of things uh, in the garage, I believe. And I go up, and about 30 minutes later, it's eerily quiet in the house. I walk around. And I notice the rooms are picked up. Hmm, that's kind of nice. I go downstairs in the living room. It is all cleaned up, toys put away. I tell my wife, did you ask them to do this? She says, no. I said, they've been cleaning up. And they know dad loves a clean house. So I go downstairs and I see some of the toys put away in the basement until I turn the corner and see some Skittles wrappers there. But dad, we cleaned up the house. Yes, they did. They did a great job. But they still grabbed the candy. I think of that story when I look at our text we have. And the theme for tonight with Joash, one, because Joash ascended the throne when he was only seven. But also because Joash does something similar to what my children did. And it makes sense. I don't say that story to talk about how my children made a misstep. After all, I'm their father. And they inherited that sin from me, and I inherited that sin from Joash, and Joash all the way back to Adam. Here we have in our text in 2 Chronicles the, the human condition, the challenge of being sinners. It starts off, though, with Joash doing pretty good work. Joash is set up for success. He had a little bit of a rough beginning. It's not in our text, but if you read the chapters beforehand, he had a grandfather, Jehoram, 
who was a, a bad king, and then Jehoram's son Ahaziah was a, a bad king. And Ahaziah did some dealings that got him killed, and Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, wanted the throne. She was so evil and wicked, she killed everyone in her family, so there was no one left but her. But Joash escaped like Moses. He was taken to safety. And so at seven years old, as chapter 24 begins, he ascends the throne. And he has a great mentor in this man, Jehoiada, a priest, one who has been faithful despite all of the apostasy of Judah. And he does some great things. He gets the people all together and he says, listen, we're going to serve the Lord God. And they agree. And so as Joash takes the throne, as he gets a bit older, Jehoiada says, listen, you got to clean God's house. You got to clean the temple. We got to get back on track. And through the, the wonderful mentorship of Jehoiada, Joash does great work. The temple had been desecrated. The worship to the Baals, the idols, all of the apostasy. It was a shell of its former self. And Joash brings it to life, collects an offering. It turns out the temple's better than before. Joash is set up for success. It reminds me of like my children, taking them on a Saturday morning to Don's Donuts. No better way to start your Saturday than some good Don's Donuts. But even more so, it reminds us as Christians how God sets us up for success in the waters of baptism. That's where faith begins. Sets us up for success in the waters of baptism. He feeds us and nourishes us with the fellowship of the saints worship, the hearing of God's word, receiving his true body and true blood. We have every reason to be successful in life. But we learn from Joash here that despite being set up for complete success, he fails. It all goes south. So he finishes the project. There's a, a wonderful sacrifice but then Jehoiada dies. And without that mentor there by Joash's side, he succumbs to the influence around him. And pretty soon he's dealing with other nations, ignoring the Lord God. Jehoiada's son Zechariah tries to preach the truth, and it's so bad that Joash has him killed. That's how far he has fallen. And I, I look at that and I think, what went wrong? Maybe you've had one of those moments. Everything was supposed to be perfect, set up for success, and it doesn't go as planned. And you think, how could this have happened? It's like the Titanic. And everyone's thinking, how did this great ship sink? What went wrong? I pondered that. What happens? Of course, Joe Ash fell into sin, but I think he made one mistake that my children made. They made because I made. Joash made because Adam made. They forgot what it meant to have a relationship with the Lord God. Joash did a great work. He cleaned the temple. He did all of the necessary things. But for him, it was all transactional. It wasn't relational. Perhaps he thought, hey, I've done this great work. I've spent all of this time rebuilding the house of the Lord. I've done his work. Check. The transaction, it's complete. My children, we cleaned the house. We did our duty. Now can we live a little? And how often is that us? I think how often is it me? We come here on a, a midweek to be in God's house, to hear his word, check, so that we can go do the things we want to do. We watch a devotional. 
We spend a few minutes a day in God's word. Check. We give our time, our talents, our resources. I know faith's going through a capital campaign. Hey, I gave a big gift. Check. Don't hold me accountable. It's that temptation that we're always facing. We live in a world that loves karma. A world that says, hey, do some good things so that it might come back to you. Do some good things to absolve the wrong things you've done. It's a system that feels good. It's so tempting. But when we cling to it like Joe Ash did, look what happens. We fall and we fall hard. God desired a clean and pure temple, but not because he just wanted that to look down from heaven at. Because the temple is where he met his people, where he forgave their sins, where he cleansed and purified their hearts. A clean temple so that the people could have what they really need. Not so much a clean temple, but a clean heart. God loves his creation. He desires to redeem. He desires to forgive. And what we see from Joash is he was a, a great king. He did great work, but it wasn't enough. And I don't know you like I know my own congregation, but if I believe the things I hear about the saints at faith, you do wonderful things for the community, wonderful things to reach out the love of Jesus to those who need it. But it can't save you. Your heart's dirty. That's what needs to be cleansed. And so Joash points us to a greater king in Jesus. Jesus, who knows that we don't just need a clean temple, we need a clean heart. And so he became the temple. He went to the cross, he died, he carried your sin, your death, your shame. And he rose victorious so that you may have life. He is the one who cleans hearts. He is your savior. He is your king. I went back to my children. I sat them down and I explained that that's not how this works. But I had the privilege to be a parent and to remind them of that beautiful relationship that we have. I make mistakes too. I need forgiveness. And just as our God, who is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, he forgives us. He lets us move on. So it is when we mess up, when we fail, like Joe Ash, in our sin, we have a Savior who cleans us and has us move on. My prayer is that as you continue in this Lenten journey, we, we look and see how God worked in these specific times with these kings, but that every day, not just in Lent, but throughout our lives, we're constantly pointed to our great king, our redeemer, the one who gives us life and word and sacrament. Amen. I invite you to please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we gather here, in this clean temple, to hear your word, to receive your gifts. We know that we are in such need of clean hearts, and you provide that. We pray that as we receive your forgiveness this evening, you would equip us and inspire us to do all of those works that you have set before us, that we may be mindful of our salvation, and also through our own living in the joy of salvation, others may be brought into your family all this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.